Your Daily Bread with Bishop Eric Kincaid Clark. Bishop Clark is the spiritual leader of the Body of Christ Assembly Church of Cleveland, Ohio. He is an author, songwriter, and recording artist. Bishop Clark inspires us to maximize our potential through biblical teachings, revelatory insight, and healthy commentary for believers and people from all walks of life. Join our community by texting MAXIMIZE to 55444. You can join Bishop Eric Kincaid Clark streaming live on YouTube every Sunday at 10 o'clock a.m. The Daily Bread Show, Monday through Friday at 9 a.m. And Wednesday midweek Bible study at 7 o'clock p.m. We invite you to join our global one-hour prayer line, Monday through Friday, by calling 712-775-8968 at 8 o'clock a.m. Eastern Standard Time. The access code is 304-282. Call your family and friends and get ready to be inspired. This is Your Daily Bread with Bishop Eric Kincaid Clark. Grace and peace be unto you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm Bishop Eric Kincaid Clark. Good morning. What a day, what a day, what a day. It is Tuesday. This is Holy Week. So we're consecrating ourselves before the Lord through fasting and prayer. Boy, the prayer was good this morning. Thank God for the prayer. I'm telling you, I appreciate the prayer. Good morning. Thank you, Minister Erica, for leading us out. And uh, Terry Buckner, Betty Buchanan. Thank you, Betty for your good prayer this morning. Mildred, thank you. Oh, what a blessing. Mildred's praying. Oh, I, I remember when Mildred joined the church. <laughs> oh, thank God. Thank God. Look at the people of God coming forth and doing the Lord's work. It's good. Boy, I'm telling you, it is good. It is good. All right. It's Tuesday morning. I hope y'all been reading. I ain't got time for slow people today. I'm going to get into my lesson and I'm going to keep it moving. We have been doing a powerful study on the life and times of David. Our theme has been leadership principles from the David narrative. We started out uh, for Samuel 17, dealing with David and Goliath, and we have taken his story. Now we're up to 2 Samuel chapter 5. We're in chapter 5. I want y'all, if you can, if you got a Bible, open it. We're going to get into the word today. Uh, so as Lisa let me know these verses are ready. We're going to put some verses up and read through it and make some interesting uh, points. You know, uh, 2 Samuel, we had a crossroads. We had a change. We had a transition where Saul is taken off the scene in the last chapter of 1 Samuel 31. I'm telling you, once you... Once, once God does and deals with the old thing in your life, he can start a new chapter. He can start a new chapter. Some of y'all need a new chapter. Amen. Well, let God deal with what is old in your life. Get the old out. Okay, thank you. The scriptures are ready. Get the old out and let's get the new in. Let God deal and do something special in your life. Amen. Amen. All right. Second Samuel chapter five, second Samuel chapter five. Uh, let's take a look at it. All of the tribes of Israel came to David to Hebron and said, we are your bone and flesh. Previously, when Saul was king over us, you were the one leading Israel out and in. Also, the Lord said to you, you will shepherd my people Israel and you will be ruler over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them before the Lord at Hebron. They anointed David king over Israel. Oh man, this is so good. David was 30 years old when he began to reign. He was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. He reigned over Israel, excuse me, over Judah from Hebron, for seven years and six months, and he reigned over all of Israel and Judah from Jerusalem um, for 33 years. He reigned for 33 years. 
six years, what is it, seven years and six months, and then 33 years, seven years and six months in Judah, 33 years in Jerusalem, a total of 40 years, the number of a generation, David is reigning for the whole generation. Now, come on, let me talk to you for a while. Um, several truths that I want to bring out, several truths that I want to bring out um, here in chapter five. First thing that we see is David is already king. We told you that the men of Judah made David king. There was one of the sons of Saul reigning in Israel. Ishbosheth was his name, and uh, he reigned for two years. But for those two years, David didn't have nothing to do with him. David didn't fight him. There was no war. Just leave him alone, even though God says you're going to reign in Jerusalem. That's, that's the Lord's business. You're going to reign over Israel. That's the Lord's business. You do not have to make the prophetic word come to pass. God will bring it to pass. Wait on the Lord and he will strengthen your heart. And so David reigns. He is a bona fide king. He is a king in Judah over the most fierce men, the fierce warriors. These guys were intense and he was their king. But now we know the story. Abner was offended by Ishbosheth. He defects to David, brings the influence to David, and uh, then Joab kills Abner. But then um, his armor bearers, Ishbosheth's armor bearers, kill him, bring his head to David, and they are put to death themselves. Now, this is for Bible readers. If you've been reading, you're keeping up. I know I'm going through it fast, but uh, if you've been reading, you're keeping up. So, after Ishbosheth is dead, Abner is dead. They have no ruler. They have no king in Israel. Now, David is king. So now the elders of Israel approach David. They approach, let me phrase it correctly. They approached King David. I know this is the big city. I know this is New York. I know this is where all the aristocrats and the affluent people are, but David is already king. God has made him king through the men of Judah. And the scripture says, they began to quote the prophecies. They said, you know what? The Lord said you was going to be king over us. They began to quote the scriptures and say things like, uh, uh, even when Saul was king, you were the one leading us out and leading us in. You led the army. You defeated Goliath. You have been the man. You were the man before you are the man. You was doing it without the title. That's what leaders do. You didn't need the title. You didn't need the position. You were already our king in many ways. And so then what David did, the scripture says, I want to give you that verse. Uh, put up verse, 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 verse three. So all the elders of Israel came to king to the king at Hebron. King David made a covenant with them. That's what I want you to see. That King David made a covenant with them before the Lord at Hebron, and then they anointed David king over Israel. Here's the next point. I don't know what point this is. Good morning, everybody. I see you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. The first point, everybody type it in. No king without covenant. Type it in. No king. There is no king in Israel without a covenant. Come on, somebody. There, there is no king. Now, David was already a king. He was king in, in, in Judah. He, he was a king. He was king, and he was a king. And now they Israel come to him and said, we want you to be our king. You, you will not get a king without a covenant. Oh, man, I will preach that. I could preach that for two hours. I preach that for two hours because there's too many women, wife and men, without a covenant. It's too many men, wife and women, without a covenant. It's too many 
um, fathers, spiritual fathers, pastors and leaders and leaders of all sorts that are mentoring people, that are pastoring, that are shepherding, that are leading and guiding without a covenant. There are too many people that have entered into a relationship and they're functioning and somebody is benefiting, but everybody's not benefiting. Why? Because there is no covenant in place. But David makes a stand to Israel and tells them, you will have no king without a covenant. Mm. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. How does that relate to you? I don't know. But I guess the point that I'm trying to make is don't let people use you. You can't be everybody's king. <laughs> you can't be everybody's leader. You can't be everybody's mentor. You can't be everybody's mama. Would you be my mother? Would you be like a mother to me? Would you be like a father to me? No, not without a covenant. There is no king without a covenant. Everybody type that in. Oh my God, type that in so you won't be used. People will use you, man. Mm -mm. I, I believe in the law of reciprocity. I believe in sowing and reaping. I believe you reap what you sow. And I believe that if somebody wants the benefits of your grace, of your anointing, of your talents, I don't care if it's you do hair, you have a covenant. They pay before you do their hair. You hear what I'm saying? I'll meet you when you meet me. I'll do this for you when you do this for me. There will be a covenant. Now, there'll be some say, Bishop, you sound ticky tacky. You sound uh, uh, small. You sound trivial. You say that that's small. Well, uh, after you live your life and you've gone through years of people using you, then you start understanding that your your gifts, your talents, your graces are not without price. I understand. No one understands like me. Freely you have received, freely you give. I understand that our ministry is unto the Lord. I understand that you serve heartily unto the Lord. I understand that. Oh, I'm clear on that. I'm clear on serving. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I'm clear on that. I know I'm getting dark because the sun is blazing. It's coming through now. But you gotta, you got to allow people to be in covenant with you. That's why I love preaching and teaching to you all this morning, in the morning, man, please. You know why? Because we in covenant. You all tithe, you sow, you serve, you are here. The people that are on this line are the people that are on the prayer line. The people that are on the daily bread are the people that are leading the daily bread. The people, I would even venture to say, the people that got in their GPS are these people that are on the line right here today. What are you saying? I'm in covenant with you. You do not have a king without a covenant. I can have a king's grace on my life, but it won't work for you. Not until we in covenant. I can have leadership as you all are anointed leaders, but those gifts and graces do not work because people are not willing to be in covenant with you. Later for that. Later for these men who want you to wife them, but they don't want to be in covenant with you. Later for these women who want you to pay this, that, and the other and give them some money and they don't want to be in covenant with you. Y'all know what I'm saying. Come on now. Don't act like you don't know what I'm saying. Later for that. There is no king without covenant. You are king. And I'm not talking about in the gender, but you are a king. You are a person of authority. You are a person that God has anointed. God's word is on you. And you don't go through your life letting everybody just take your stuff, use your stuff. Amen. Be blessed by who you are and what you do. I need a new battery for this. No, you don't do that. Don't do that. If you want me to be your king, then you need to be in covenant. You got me? If you want me to be king, that's what you got to tell people. That might sound a little arrogant and funny. I don't care how it sounds. I don't care how it sounds. Mm -mm. I ain't giving myself to people that's going to use me. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. 
If you want a king, then let's make a covenant. I covenant to feed you with knowledge and understanding. I covenant to pray for you. I covenant to prophesy over you. I covenant to speak words that will help you maximize your potential. I covenant to seek God's face, to study in the word night and day, to be prayerful at all times that the Holy Spirit can speak to me for you. I covenant to do that. Now, what you going to do? Come on. All we ask is that you would honor the Lord with your support, with your tithe, with your offering, with your sacrificial giving. That's right. Honor the Lord so we can do the work of the Lord, so we can go forth. So, hey, there must be meat in the Father's house so your priests can eat. No sense of me giving myself to everyone and then got to go work a job. I'm working a job. You my job. You my responsibility. You can have no king without covenant. That's what David was saying to Israel. And that's what you've got to say to everyone in your life that's pulling on you. I feel, let me say this. Some of y'all need to be approaching your job and your boss about a raise. You need to be approaching your people about paying you more. Why? Because there is no king without covenant. In any area you feel used, or you got to tighten it up, tighten it up. I didn't have to. I didn't have to help this one and help that one and this that. Okay, no problem. I'll do that. That's part of. That's in my sphere of influence. That's part of what God has called me to do. But there is no king without covenant. Do you see that? I see that right in the text. There is no king without covenant. Arlene, you getting this? There is no king without covenant. No covenant, no king. That's right, Mother Clark. There is no king without covenant. All right, let's pick it up. Verse number six. The king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites. So he, he's going and established his kingdom now in Jerusalem. The first place they went was to Jerusalem. Um, and they, they had some opposition called the Jebusites who were living in the land. They said to David, this is what they said, you won't enter in here. Even the blind and the lame will turn you away, thinking that David could not enter there. Nevertheless, David overthrew the stronghold of Zion, which is now the city of David. The strongest opposition became his strongest place of influence and power. Verse eight, David said on that day, whoever defeats the Jebusites, Let him go through the water shaft to reach the lame and the blind who are despised by David. Therefore, it is said the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. So David occupied the stronghold and he called it the city of David. And he built on all sides from the terraces inward. David went on and became great because the Lord, The God of hosts was with him. The King James say he grew great. He became great. He grew great because the Lord of hosts was with him. Leaders conquer Zion. Type it in. Leaders conquer Zion. Zion was an impenetrable force in the center of the city of Jerusalem. It was a mountain who was steep on three sides. You could not climb Mount Zion from the south side, from the east side, from the west side. There was only access in the climbing Zion. You could only reach its pinnacle by going up the north face or the north side of the mountain. And so the Bible says there were people that lived on the top of Zion. They were called the Jebusites. And so their city was impenetrable. Their city was a stronghold. They were formidable because of their position on top of the mountain. As a matter of fact, they were so proud about their position. People would try to attack Zion, and they'd say, we don't even need an army. We could use the blind people. We could use those who are lame in our city, and they will keep you out. Why? Because they just hurl down stones down the mountain on the one side that there was access, and that was the north side. So 
a lot of people conquered these areas and had come and even had residence in these areas. But right in the middle of Jerusalem, in the middle of your paradise, is a elephant in the room, is a big eye spot, a sore spot. It's a, it's a place where the Jebusites live and no one could conquer them. It's, it's like a stronghold in your life. You got saved, but you still got this stronghold. You got delivered. You are born again. You feel the Holy Ghost, but but you do have this stronghold in your life. You got this one thing that just like you can't conquer. And you know what? It's blaring. It's glaring. It's in everybody's face. It's right here. And you can't conquer it. I've seen people. I've seen people, born again believers, um, love God, walking with God, but have the stronghold of cigarettes or have a stronghold of cursing, using bad language, or have the stronghold of sexual immorality, or have the stronghold of lying. Some people have a stronghold of pornography, have a stronghold of, I mean, you got a stronghold. What, what is that thing? I don't know what that is, but it's something that you're challenged with. You know you saved. You know you're born again. You know you love God. You know you're walking with the Lord. You know you're not the same person you used to be before you received Christ, but you are struggling with this stronghold. There's something that's got power over you. It's got its grips over you, and you have not been able to get free. Well, leaders conquer Zion. Leaders, con type it in, people. Leaders conquer Zion. How did David conquer the Zion? How did David conquer the stronghold? How did he conquer the stronghold of Zion? He went up through the gutter. How did he do it? He went up through the gutter. I preached this a hundred times. The gutter is the place of defecation and urination. It's the place of garbage and trash and refuse. It's a waterway. It's a stream that flows down the mountain. It's the gutter. I've been to Africa. I've been to Africa. I've been to Accra. I've been to Accra where there was refugee camps 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Uh, the people of Liberia found refuge in Ghana, in Accra. And I went out to the middle of nowhere. It's it's the uh, what they call the desert. It's the bush. That's what they call it. Way out in the bush, in the middle of nowhere. And they don't have no bathrooms. There ain't no bathrooms. There ain't no porta potties out there. They have a gutter. So you walking through the city, and right in the middle of the street is a is a gutter. It's a, it's a trench and it's, it's a trench and they, 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 when they get water, certain people, certain times of the day, they flush the trench. They try to pour water in it or keep water running in it. Why? Because that's where the urination and the defecation is. Folk are handling their business in, in buckets and other me. And then they come and put it in a trench, try to wash it on down. It's the gutter. Well, if you can, I don't mean to gross anybody out, but if you can imagine this trench, this gutter going up a mountain. And the Bible says that David declared to his men, the first one that gets to the top of Zion and starts beating down them Jebusites, that's who going to be my captain. That's who's going to be the leader in my army. Well, it was Joab, his cousin, his crazy, crazy cousin. His crazy cousin didn't have a problem with the defecation. His crazy cousin didn't have a problem with the urination, didn't have a problem with the stench. Crazy good for something, ain't it? I said crazy good for something, ain't it? Lord have mercy. The leaders conquer Zion. And so Joab went up through the place. It represents to us fasting. Are you fasting this week? It represents to us prayer. Are you, are you, do you make, um, uh, you push through and get to the prayer? I enjoy the prayer. Amen. This morning, I enjoyed the prayer yesterday. I see you, Elaine. Thank you for that powerful prayer yesterday. All those that are leading in the prayer. What a blessing. What a blessing. But that's that's the hard stuff. That's the that's the trench. That's the gutter. Stronghold. That's how you conquer it. You got to do what nobody else wants to do. 
You got to burn the candle at both ends. You got to burn the midnight oil. You got to do your read. You got to do your writing. You got to do your reconnaissance. You got to persevere. You know, that's why one of the things I say to those that I mentor and those that I inspire, I don't apologize for my success. And I have it by the grace of God, but I don't apologize for it. Why? Because I work hard. I I work hard. I was so tired yesterday. I just got to my bed and just fell asleep. I went to, I just laid down and just instantly I was asleep. I'm just tired. You, you surf, you do different things. All the stuff I do, it just wore me out. I work hard. That's all I'm saying. I work hard. I work, I work hard. And I don't have no apologies for what I accomplish in my life, in my ministry, in my family. I don't have no apologies for that. And somebody want to be jealous, be jealous. Jealousy is somebody else's problem. It ain't mine. And when you know you work hard, when you know you do what you're supposed to do, when you know that you make a presentation, that presentation is awesome. It's amazing. Because you working hard, you putting your time in and people will applaud you and say great things and this, that, and the other. And we give God all praise or we give him all the glory. Nobody tripping now. Ain't nobody tripping at the same time. Hard work cashes checks. At the same time, when you put your work in, I mean, a lot of people want easy street. They want easy street. They want, they cake and eat it too. They want to be successful without hard work. They want to conquer Zion without dealing with a gutter. Well, if you're going to conquer Zion, you got to deal with a gutter. You got to deal with some crap. You got to deal with some stuff that most people don't want to deal with. And if you are willing to deal with it, crazy Joab, then you become the captain in the army. Somebody type this in, earn your stripes. Oh man, it's been a while since I preached that. I used to preach that message all over the country. Earn your stripes. In the U.S. military, you could have a three-star general, a five-star general. You could have so they got stripes. The stripes not only represents their years of service, but it represents their rank and authority. When you see their stripes, it's because what they have endured, what they have accomplished, what they have gone through. And if you see a star, three-star, five-star, four-star General, are you kidding me? This person has been in war, has survived. You see a purple heart. You see uh, all these different accolades that are given to the to the ranking officers. These people didn't just, you don't just get this. Are you hearing me? These people have suffered their life. They have, they have, they have, they have endangered themselves. They have, they have been a hero. Too many. They have made decisions. They have endured hardship. They have been in camps. They have been captured. They have lost a limb. They have gone blind in an eye. They have lost their hearing. They, oh my God, these people have endured incredible hardship and they have earned their stripes. I have never in my life seen so many people that want accolades and don't want to do the work. They want to be the boss without the cost. They want to have it going on and don't do nothing. They don't want to do school. They don't want to do hard work. They don't want to do longevity. They don't want to start on the bottom and climb to the, they don't want to do nothing. They just want to be, you just want to be great. No, this text says that David grew great. I'm growing into my greatness. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Can anybody say amen to that? I'm growing into my greatness. How? Working hard, keeping my head down, doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm focusing and focusing and focusing and doing my work. I was telling the leader just recently, there's a lot of times you're dealing with people and you use the wrong verbiage in ministry. What we're doing is ministry. We're not looking for volunteers. We're looking for ministry. People who are called to serve. I'm called to serve. I'm not a volunteer. Yeah, when I go and do this, that, I'm not volunteering. My allegiance is to the Lord. I work hard, heartily unto the Lord. That's what gives your strength. That's how you conquer Zion. You ain't going to conquer Zion with no volunteer mentality. Volunteers show up when they want to, leave when they want to, do what they want to. Nobody tell a volunteer nothing. 
But when you are in ministry, you subjugate yourself to the purpose of God and to those who are over you. When you're in ministry, you work with your passion and your might and you earn your stripes. Look at your neighbor, say neighbor, neighbor, earn your stripes. Stop wanting something for nothing. You see the girl looking good? It ain't always liposuction and a, and a whatever else she hasn't done. Sometimes she actually earn her stripes. She's running and watching what she eat. That's what I'm doing. I'm trying to do what I got to do. Get myself together. You got to earn your stripes. Ooh, I want to keep preaching. My time is up. My time is up. Let me see. My time is up. The conquered Zion. Let me give you one more thing. Let me give you one more thing out of chapter five. Verse 11, King Hiram of Tyra sent messengers to David with cedar wood, carpenters, stonemasons, and they built a house for David. Oh, see, you can't get no king without covenant. Now they built him a house. Then David understood that the Lord had appointed him king over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people. That's what I want you to see. God exalted David and his kingdom for the sake of his people, Israel. David took more concubines and wives in Jerusalem. He got some more. Lord have mercy. Uh, he got some more. After having come from Hebron and they bore him more sons and daughters. These are the names of the children born to him in Jerusalem. Uh, you got all these names. Shema, Shobab, Nathan, Solomon, Ithar, Elishua. <laughs> you might as well put a woman with each one of these kids. Lord, have mercy. All right, David. I see you. I see you, David. <laughs> but what I want you to see is a verse number 12. The Lord exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people. Leaders, you got to get this. I'm going to leave this alone. I'm going to leave this alone. I'm going to leave this alone. God blesses his people through the leader. Never forget that. If you want to see God's love, see who he places over them. Because the Lord blesses the people through their leader. That's why they, they used to say LeBron's Cavaliers. No LeBron, no championship. We don't get to the finals, hardly get, or well, we've been through the playoffs a little bit. But he's the leader, okay? He's doing his thing out in L.A. Hopefully he'll get them to the playoffs. But God blesses the people through their leader. Who is the leader? And that's, in, that's on the job. That's in the community. That's in the home. That's in the church. That's everywhere. God blesses the people through the leader. So God wants your leader blessed. Somebody type that in. God wants your leader blessed. I'm not having you type this in for me. I'm your leader in some ways, but you have other leaders. And then you are a leader. This is why you got to understand that you got to be blessed. If you're a leader, you got to be blessed. You're leading your family. You got to be blessed. If you lead, if you lead, whatever you're leading, you got to be blessed. Why? So God can bless his people. He blesses the people through the leader. Hallelujah. You do not want a broke leader. You do not want a, 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 a sickly, tired, can't do nothing, ain't got nothing leader. You do not want a bad leader. Mm -mm. You want your leader to be blessed. You notice the principle here in America. You know, look at former President Donald Trump. This guy is abusing the leadership privileges. He's like, no, the president could do anything he wanted to do. He can't be charged for nothing. No, that's a little abuse. That's a little abusive right there. But we do understand the principle that the leader has got to be blessed. He lives in the White House. He has He has bodyguards and security detail. He's got staff. He's got people that... Whatever, we pay him this, we give him these benefits, and then even after he served for the rest of his life, we take care of him and his family for the rest of their lives. Are you kidding me? Leadership has to be blessed. Your leader has to be blessed. I'm going to stop. There's more. There's more. Read chapter five. I want you to read chapter five because there's more. Go on, delve into chapter six a little bit, but there's more in chapter five I want to deal with. We're, we're here at Holy Week. We're fasting this week. 
If you not fasting, come on, join us on the fast till five o'clock. Amen. For those that will join us Sunday, I got on my white today. I got on my white today. Y'all put some white on or, or bring a white handkerchief as we unify ourselves and come before the Lord there at the Silver Spot uh, Movie Theater. It's going to be great. It's going to be good. We're going to have a good time and uh, come with that good energy. Come with that resurrection energy. Hey, let's praise him. <laughs> Hallelujah. But let's take this week and look back. Here we're coming up on tomorrow, Wednesday. We got special presentations in the morning and tomorrow evening. The good word of God is going to come forth. And uh, let's look back at the suffering Savior. Let's look back at um, the Last Supper and the garden and the arrest and the trial. And uh, let's look at the other players that were involved. And let's see Jesus, our Lord and Savior, go to the cross. What did he endure? What did he deal with? Let's take a look at that on this week. And then Sunday, let's shout the victory. I want everybody there, everybody, put it out. I want everybody at the Silver Spot, amen, on time. You want to come at 9.30, 9.30. You want to be there so we can enjoy the Lord. We're going to enjoy the Lord, all right? Okay, I want everybody to have a great day. The lesson said that there was, there was uh, David was 30 years old when he started reigning in Judah and 37, when he reigned in Israel, he reigned a total of 40 years total. He reigned seven and a half, and then he reigned 33 years, 40 years, that number of, of, of tests. For those that can, I want to challenge you to sow a $30 seed. You're going to come into it. That's the word I'm speaking over you. You're getting ready to come into it. What? Judah and Israel. You're about to bring both nations, both cities, both cities and peoples together. You're about to come into it. You're about to come into it. You're about to grow great. Look at David. You know, I know we live in a in a um, um, uh, monogamous society. He lived in this polygamous society, and it was a sign of strength. It was a sign of power and prosperity. That man, and you know, he had already had a Hinnam and Abigail and other women. He had it going on, but now he becomes king in Israel. He takes more wives and more concubines. Look at David expanding his influence and expanding his strength. God bless you. Someone's sowing. Someone is giving. Who is giving? I might as well see. I want to bless you. LaShonda, I should have known. God bless you, LaShonda. We love you. We love you. We love you. The kingdom of God is expanding. Amen. Okay. I just got the word that um, Arlene, are you with me? Uh, well, we're praying for you, Arlene. Your sister passed away last night. Denise Williams. Well, our prayers are with you, Arlene. Our prayers of comfort and strength are with you and your family. We're praying for you, Arlene. We're going to pray for you even as we conclude today. Once again, I want all of the people of God to sow. For those that would, sow that $30 seed. Release it today in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Be a blessing. If you don't have that, you be a blessing. Give as the Lord has prospered you. The Holy Spirit push you beyond that 30, then you, you do it. You do it. You do what God said do in your giving. Make sure that you honor the Lord with your tithe. That is important, imperative in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father, thank you now. Thank you for the word. Thank you for conquering Zion. Thank you for understanding how important leadership is. Thank you for understanding there is no king without covenant. Thank you for your people. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for Denise Williams that you've called home. Thank you for our precious daughter, Arlene. God, we pray that you would strengthen her and bless her family, even as they, as they move forward this week through troubled waters, celebrating life as well as mourning death. We pray for them now. We speak blessing over all the saints today. Even as Pastor Buckner prayed, Father, let today be a special day, a blessed day. Thank you that needs are met in Jesus' name. 
Amen. All right. I love you. Can't wait to see you in the morning. Until then, peace to the family. Thank you for watching Your Daily Bread with Bishop Eric and Kate Clark. Don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and hit the notification bell to stay connected with our YouTube community.